So, um, so welcome to the to the course. Uh, as you heard, I'm Ranil Vikramasinghe. So I'm from uh, the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Arkansas. And uh, what I thought I'd do in this introduction is tell you a little bit about myself, about our department, and some of my research. And then we talk about the course. But I'd also like you to introduce yourselves. So let's begin. Um, I can keep going, right? OK. Uh, so firstly, uh, let me tell you where the University of Arkansas is. So this is a map of the US. And Arkansas is here. So it's in the south uh, central part of the United States bordered by Texas, uh, uh, New, um, Louisiana, uh, and so forth. Let, if we look at just Arkansas itself, this is the map of Arkansas. And uh, if you look to the, to the left is Oklahoma and Texas, and to the north is Kansas and, uh, and Missouri. And then to the, to the east is Mississippi, to the south is Louisiana. So probably, the, I don't know what you know about Arkansas. Most people know that Bill Clinton came from Arkansas. That's probably the main thing. But we like to think that there's more to Arkansas than, than Bill Clinton. And so what I wanted to say is there are two important things in terms of membrane science and technology. One is that we are one of three sites of the so-called Membrane Science, Engineering, and Technology, or MAST Center. And I'll tell you more about this center. But that is a center that I run. And also, there's a thing called the North American Membrane Society, like the Indian Membrane Society. And the head office of the North American Membrane Society is in my department. One of my colleagues is actually the secretary of that. So, so we are quite uh, prominent in the area of membrane science and technology. Um, a little bit about the University of Arkansas. So the University of Arkansas, oops, we lost it. Yep, um, is uh, our department is is much is smaller than yours since we have 16 faculty, uh, 13 so-called tenure tenure track uh, undergraduates. We have about 300 in the in the program basically for starting from second year students to, to seniors, so second, third, fourth year. Okay? The first year is common for all engineering. Um, we have about 42 graduate students. The numbers are there, uh, postdocs uh, and so forth. Um, these are numbers for 2018. And actually, we are starting to do this again. We stopped doing it during, uh, during the pandemic since it was, it was difficult to get students and so forth. But the numbers are very similar today. And that's a picture of the University of Arkansas below. So Arkansas is, uh, is a relatively, uh, uh, climate-wise, it's relatively mild, much colder than Calicut, but relatively mild. Um, our research focuses in the, in, the, in the department include membrane separations, biopharmaceuticals, which I'm going to talk about. But I also said we work on membrane separations for water treatment and for biofuels manufacturing. There is a big focus on sustainability. One of my colleagues has a lot of work in uh, life cycle analysis and so forth for uh, various uh, uh, areas. Um, Bioenergy is another big one, K through 12 education. Medical applications. So I'll talk a little bit about biomedical applications. But a few of my colleagues work on different sorts of uh, basically uh, uh, growing cells for tissue engineering and things like that. Uh, hazardous chemicals and then material science. So that's sort of the research focus of our department. Um, one of the interesting things about University of Arkansas, if you graduate from the University of Arkansas, uh, yes, um, what will happen is that when you graduate, your name is written on the, on the sidewalk somewhere, okay? So, so you can see here, it's called Senior Walk at University of Arkansas, and it started in 1905. And so I didn't realize this, but the names were carved by hand till 86, and now they have some machine that does it. But I'm amazed they were doing it by hand. But anyway, there are over 170,000 names on this. So, so if you walk around, you find names. So anybody who graduates from there can go and find their name. And it includes uh, graduate students as well now. I think graduate students was more recent, maybe like the last 30 years. But undergraduates from the start of the university. So this is kind of amazing. Uh, and you can, you can find that. One other thing, we, the University of Arkansas has many campuses. The campus that I am on is located in a place called Fayetteville, which is probably not very famous for anything except that Walmart, which is a very large uh, uh, store uh, company in the US, actually, is headquartered in Northwest Arkansas. So we have quite a lot of industry. Um, and the northwest corner of Arkansas is actually quite developed. Um, then it was named the fourth best place to live in the United States for cities of that size. The total area has a population of about 250 to 300,000. So it's, it's relatively rural. Um, um, it's home to the headquarters of the 3, 4, 3, 5. I mentioned Walmart. 
also a company called Tyson Foods. Tyson Foods actually is an international company, and they sell all sorts of meat. Their, their thing is they process chicken meat, uh, actually all meat except, uh, except uh, fish. They don't work with fish at all. So one of the projects we also work on is water treatment at Tyson facilities, because actually in this, this process of, uh, of uh, producing chicken meat, a lot of water is used, actually 25 liters per bird. So if you are processing a million birds a week, you can imagine there's a huge amount of water, very high BOD, very high COD. And so treatment of the water is essential before you can uh, discharge it. So that's another thing we do. And then there are various other, other facilities there. We have a, a, a world-class museum and so forth. Um, the University of Arkansas has uh, this uh, mascot, and our mascot is the Razorback, which is a mythical, mythical pig. It's a mythical hog, okay? So it's not real, but, but this is the mascot of the university. And this is how it has grown over time. Um, and then finally, some details about, uh, about uh, doctoral studies at the University of Arkansas. But uh, let me move on. So let me introduce myself next. So I uh, got my BS and MS from the University of Melbourne. I got my PhD from the University of Minnesota. I worked for five years uh, in industry, and it was in the biotech industry. I worked for a company called Biogen, which is a rather large um, biopharmaceutical company in Boston. And then uh, after five years in industry, I actually moved to Colorado State University, where I started off as an assistant professor and ended up as a full professor before moving to University of Arkansas about 11 years ago. Um, I moved to University of Arkansas, and actually at University of Arkansas is where I really started to get this membrane center organized. Okay? Um, so these, I think these facts you already heard uh, in the introduction, so I'm going to skip over that one. My research focus, I was briefly telling some of, the, some of you just now that uh, I work on membrane-based uh, separation processes for purification of biopharmaceuticals and pharmaceuticals. That is a major focus these days, and that came out of some of my industrial work when I was in industry. And that's what we're going to talk about in this, in this class. But we also work very much on water treatment, especially wastewater treatment. I mentioned briefly that we work with uh, wastewater treatment, uh, uh, various areas, agricultural wastewater, aquaculture wastewater, things like hydroponics, and aquaponics is another area that we work in, and then also um, um, what we call hydraulic fracturing flow back water. So hydraulic fracturing, is there any hydraulic fracturing in India? I don't know. No, but in US it's very big, it, it's huge. In fact, uh, so it's basically trying to get oil and gas from what they call non-traditional sources. So basically, you have oil and gas trapped in very, very impervious rock formations. So just drilling a hole will not help. So you drill, you fracture the rock, increase the porosity of the rock, prevent these fissures from closing. Then when you release the pressure, you can recover the oil and gas. But it requires a lot of water. And so recovering and reusing that water is actually critical. Because, and we don't do that at the moment. Okay? So at the moment, we collect all this water and we pump it down somewhere else and try and hide it, if you like, in a, in a geologically isolated formation. And, and that's not really a very sustainable thing to do. So we work in that area. I mentioned uh, water for Tyson and so forth. And then the other area is in this production of biofuels and chemicals. So uh, we've worked a lot over the years in trying to uh, come up with what we, in, in chemical engineering, would call an intensified process. So we link unit operations together and try and come up with a catalytic membrane for biomass uh, hydrolysis and dehydration, as well as producing chemical enemies. And again, if you're interested in that, I can tell you all about that uh, at some other time. OK, before I go on to the, 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 the um, membrane center I run, maybe I can get some background about all of you. So maybe I will ask Dr. Jacob, since that will break the ice, you could tell me who is online. And welcome to the online people. And what is their background? Maybe. Yeah. So one is uh, Dr. Shivam, he's a professor. Uh huh. Uh, I forget where exactly. And one is we're well, doing him online. That's all our. Okay. All right. So so welcome. And uh, maybe I'll move to you now. So so just tell me uh, basically what your research interests are, or what department you're in, or something like this, so I get some idea of what your background is. Uh, so I'm Malavi from NIT Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. So bioseparations is new then. It's a it's a new area. Okay. 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 Very good. Yeah.
Okay. Okay, okay. So you know, MOFs are very interesting, um, but the, one of the things that comes up in bias separations that's very important is people are very concerned about what any leachate, so anything that leaches from the membrane, because you have to validate all this. And so that's a big difference when you think about bias separation. Water treatment, this is also important, but the regulations are much, much stricter in bias separations. So that's one thing that's different. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. My both of the next topic is buyer of the system for environmental degradation. Okay. Now I want to know more about both of the like microbiologist and the Right, right. So we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, basically microfiltration and ultrafiltration and variations on that. Those are the main pressure driven membrane processes in, in bio separations. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so you're from chemical engineering or from chemistry? Chemistry, okay. Okay, okay. So also from chemistry then. Okay. Okay. All right. This side. I'm Purusha Mary and I have just joined my PhD at Oma University. I'm working on the development of hybrid polymer printing for vapor treatment. And I'm also interested to develop numbers for gas efficient as well as fluid dynamic conditions for conversion of vapor to materials. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that's an interesting topic which we could, if we have time, talk about because uh, the photocatalytic part is very interesting, but it's not related to bias separation. So I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you're working with membrane distillation or? Oh, forward osmosis. Okay, okay. Right, okay. Very good. Okay. Okay, very good. Actually, we do electrospinning, but we are not working really with biopolymers. We work more with traditional PVDF and things like this. Um, electrospinning is actually a very interesting area for developing new membranes for virus treatment, which I hope we'll get into by Wednesday, perhaps Tuesday or Wednesday. Yes. Okay. Very good. I'm Nandani, and I'm a recent graduate from Christ Church Library with Tennessee Chemistry. So I have to join as a hypothesis and internship track based on the previous polymers. So the previous previous part in the community. So I can't be explained. Okay. 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 So a lot of people here from chemistry and a lot are working actually on material science applications more than uh, say engineering applications. So so that, that's good. I have a few comments at the end. Last three, I think. Three of you left, or who is left? Two of you left. Yeah. 
Ya. Oke. 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 And Okay, very good. So if I can take a summary of all that, as I said, m many of you are working in chemistry areas, many are working on more on, uh, on uh, material science applications, quite a bit of work on electrospinning, I noticed, and a very heavy focus on water treatment remediation. So what I would say is as we go through this, please ask me questions. If I, if I go through fast or there are things you, that were not so clear, let me know, okay? Because I would say in the bioseparations area, uh, and especially because this is more from engineering, I'm going to talk more about trying to develop purification streams and, and how we link unit operations together. So uh, I'm not going to talk that much about making membranes. I think Dr. Jacob will talk a little bit in his introduction about membrane casting. Okay, very good. So with that background, let's continue. Let me tell you a little bit about our university, uh, uh, our industry university cooperative research center. That's what IUCRC stands for. And this basically actually is a center where we do a lot of our work in bioseparation. So that's why I thought it would be interesting to talk about it. Plus it's a very interesting model, especially if we want to talk more about research collaborations in the future. So this is a program that was started by the National Science Foundation in the US. And it's quite an old program. It must have started about 35, 40 years ago. Our center is actually now the oldest center in the program. So it has been running since uh, 1990. Okay, in one form or another. But the idea is this, the, the National Science Foundation tries to bring together these various stakeholders. So it says here, NSF catalyzes partnerships. Uh, so basically, NSF, if you like, provides the framework for this center, but actually doesn't put much money into it, but they provide the framework. Other government agencies, so military labs, uh, NIST, uh, any other government lab, uh, the army labs, anybody, could join the center as a sponsor. A sponsor is someone who pays money. Uh, we have a membership fee. At the moment, it's $60,000 a year. So you pay that money, you join the center. And what we do is we pool all this membership money, and that is what funds our research. So you can work out how much money we have if we have, we have actually 16 sponsors. So everyone pays 60000 a year. So that's the money that we have to run the research. As I said, NSF provides very little money for this. But NSF provides the framework. The idea is then the universities provide the infrastructure, human capital, and technical expertise. So, and then industry, because it's really industry, NSF is not that keen to get other government agencies involved, but they can join. But really, industry provides funding and provides the research insights and basically provides the research project. So it's a very interesting center in that the research program is driven by industry. And that's particularly relevant to bioseparations because all the research we do is very much industry driven, okay? So today industry is really worried or, or concerned that bioseparations represents what they call a bottleneck for new drugs. So if you think of uh, the, the way drugs are made, biopharmaceuticals, you start off where you have these cell culture operations. It turns out that today we can generally produce these uh, therapeutics at very high titer. That, that actually is quite well done today. The problem is the purification. The purification operations can't handle these high titers. So in a center like this, then, we get projects that work on industrial applications. So that is the idea of this center. And if you look here, the idea is that we are supposed to work in this gap. So you have early stage research is very fundamental research. You have these various technology readiness levels as things start to go towards becoming commercialized. And we work in this gap here. So NSF likes to call it uh, pre-competitive research. But really, another thing to think about is if you have different competitor companies working together, they can't be working on something that's very close to a product. It has to be somewhat removed from the product. Um, and I'll tell you more about that in a second. Now, our center actually involves a collaboration between a number of universities. So University of Arkansas is what we call the lead site. University of Colorado Boulder is a partner. Penn State is a partner. And New Jersey Institute of Technology is a partner. And I've just listed the names of the, the site directors at these various places. We also have a collaboration with uh, Jongyun University in Taiwan. So those are our university partners. If you like, they are the ones that are providing the, the infrastructure and the expertise in terms of faculty. Okay. Um, our research program is broken up into various themes. Biopharmaceutical processing is by far the largest, but we also work on what we call water purification, basically wastewater treatment. Uh, 
chemical separation. So, chemi so membranes are also used, and nobody mentioned it here, but chemicals are also used uh, these days for trying to work with recovery of solvents, right? Organic solvents. So you have these solvent resistant membranes. That's a very big uh, development these days. So that's what chemical separations means, really. Trying to look at organic separations, okay, as opposed to aqueous separations. Membrane fundamentals is membrane casting, making membranes. A big push these days from the membrane companies is to try and make membranes using green solvents. For those of you that work in membrane casting, you would know the solvents that are used uh, are not particularly easy to handle environmentally. Uh, and then another new area is food and beverage. That's another area that we're trying to get into. Membranes used a lot in the dairy industry and then in various other areas as well. So that's the center. And then these are our sponsors. So you can see, if you look at our sponsors, that uh, there is a, a very large number of biotech companies. So you may have heard of some of these. Uh, we've got Biogen, uh, Amgen, uh, Cytiva, which used to be GE Healthcare, CSL Bearing. Uh, there are quite a few here. And then we have, um, we have uh, membrane companies. So we have 3M, Asai Kase makes membranes for the biotech industry. Uh, who else? Millipore, Paul, WL Gore make membranes. Uh, and then we have Water Treatment Area, Bureau of Reclamation, Gava is an engineering design company, Tyson I mentioned to you already, actually they produce meat, but we work with them in the water treatment area. So all of these companies, if you like, pay 60000 their money is pooled, they decide on the research projects we are going to work on, so they have ideas and they have to vote on them. So we write proposals, they vote on what they want to, what they want to fund. Okay, and typically they're funded for one year with possible extensions after that. And that's kind of important because industry can change focus very quickly. And so if you fund for three years, it becomes very difficult, right? So they fund for one year, but the other side of it is a PhD isn't finished in one year. So, so I would say this, usually projects are extended at least once for two years, but if they change, and as we do go through the bioseparations work, you will see changes are often kind of like uh, slight changes in direction. So the student ends up working on something that's related, but, but not exactly what they were trying to do in the first place, you see? And I'll explain that more as we go on. So that's our center, which is very interesting. And I had mentioned earlier that, in fact, NSF has a program whereby it is possible for the center to collaborate with other institutions. And actually, NSF provides, that NSF provides money to go overseas and work on those. So that's one way for collaboration. Okay, so with that background to me and the, and the research I do and, and so forth, let me talk a little bit about this course and how I had, had structured it with uh, uh, Professor Jacob. So basically, um, this is this introduction to membranes and then uh, the, the, what happens next is, I think you're going to give a lecture that's going to focus more on membrane casting and things like this, right? So then my first lecture that I'll start on today, and if we have time I'll even start now, is on bioreactor harvesting, and I'll explain later, that is basically the first step in what we call the downstream purification of biopharmaceutical products. So to reiterate again, when you're making a, what we're trying to do is make drugs, but we're not making them by chemical synthesis. We're making them using microorganisms, okay? There are advantages to that because some of these drugs are quite complex, and we can program cells, mammalian cells, bacterial cells, depending on the drug, we can program it to make this compound. So that's very nice. If you do it by chemical synthesis, there are many, many steps in requiring organic solvents, and it's very complicated. And so that's rather difficult, okay? So this is very nice. The problem is, though, that if an animal, typically I'm going to talk about mammalian cells, if, if, if it makes this product, right, you now have to get that product out from the cell and make it into a form that you can actually give it to a patient. So, you know, if you imagine that I made a cell, uh, made a, made a, made a, a, a drug, uh, just for example, take some uh, Chinese hamster ovary cell, that's typically used for this sort of work. You don't want to go and infuse any of the, the Cho cell, the Chinese hamster ovary cell components into the patient. That would be uh, disastrous, right? Because it'll cause tremendous side effects, you might kill the patient. So the major complication here is trying to remove all these contaminants and end up with your pure compound. And in the process, not damage the compound as you produce it, you see. So, so that is the major challenge. And bioreactor harvesting turns out to be the first of the processes. So we will talk about that. We will talk about sterile filtration. So sterile filtration is important. Uh, I'll explain later because actually anything you add 
So if you imagine you've got your bioreactor, you're harvesting it, you're recovering your product of interest, but in the process you do various operations, so you have to add buffers, you add the diluents, you add various things. Anything you add cannot contaminate your product. Okay, because if it did, you're finished. And so that's why sterile filtration is important as a, as a basically a, a way to guarantee, and often it's an additional check to make sure there's no contamination. Sterile filtration though typically refers to pathogens, not viruses. Okay, so you're removing any sort of microorganisms and things like this. So that's, that's very critical in this whole process. Uh, I'll talk about ultrafiltration. So many of you work on water treatment, so you are probably familiar with ultrafiltration. By the way, I forgot to add that bioreactor harvesting is basically a microfiltration process. You're removing particulate matter. Ultrafiltration is now you've got your protein of interest in a liquid stream. You want to concentrate it. Also for the chemists here, you want to do buffer exchange. So I'm sure you are aware of this. You, you can exchange buffers, say, by doing dialysis and so forth. We use ultrafiltration, and I'll explain that, okay? Um, and then we have a guest lecture from Professor Chidham on electroactive membranes. I don't exactly know what he's going to talk about, but, I, but he's very well know, very good, so I think this should be interesting. I will then talk about virus filtration. Virus filtration in the biotech industry is somewhat unique, I would say, because what you're trying to do is uh, validate or, or guarantee that you're removing any contaminating virus particles. So if we back up again, uh, we think of these cells, we've taken the cells, we've produced a product, we've done all these various purifications to try and recover this product, right? But now regulatory authorities like the FDA in the US will come and tell you, you need to validate, you need to guarantee to me that there are no contaminating viruses. I told you sterile filtration was only removing microorganisms, okay? So microorganisms, you're talking about micron-sized things, right? Viruses, you're talking about things on the nanometer scale. So why do we worry about viruses? So I can tell you there are no viruses there because people ran this in a non-sterile way. That is not the reason, okay? But there could be viruses for a couple of reasons. The whole premise of biotechnology is to take cells, right? And Chinese hamster ovary cells in the natural state are not designed to produce proteins, right? That's not their job. They are in, they are in hamsters, right? They're ovary cells. So we have modified them to a different function. We've changed their genetic material so that they are programmed now to produce our product of interest. But how did we make that change? Usually, we make it by using virus vectors. You take a virus particle, now you modify the virus particle, so its job is no longer to produce more virus particles and, and basically infect cells, but rather to transmit this genetic material into the cell to modify the cell so the cell will now produce the product you want. That's very good, and that, that's great. But the problem is, the cell will also reproduce virus particles. Okay, these are typically what we call retroviruses. It will reproduce these virus particles. And so that is a problem, because there is a lot of evidence to suggest that these virus particles are non-infective. They are kind of like dead. Viruses are not living, really. They are, their only job is, they can only reproduce if they have a host, right? They can't reproduce by themselves. But nevertheless, it's unlikely that these will go and infect anything, but nevertheless, the cells produce them in rather large numbers. And there is evidence to suggest that if you go and inf infuse a patient with these, you will have side effects, which could be quite bad, okay? So again, you've got to validate that you've removed them. That's one reason why you have virus particles. The second is called so-called adventitious virus infection. And uh, that is because if you use growth medium, these cells have to live, right? They grow. You use growth medium. If this growth medium is derived from animal components, okay? You can have synthetic growth medium. That's fine. That has no virus. But if it's animal derived, it is possible that, uh, suppose you're using bovine serum albumin for some example, that's a very good component in growth medium. If it's coming from actual animals, it is possible that viruses present in the animal somehow survive the processing and are now present in the, in the growth medium. Again, you could, you could argue the possibility is low, but it has happened, and so regular products are very strict on this. You have to guarantee that if the virus is there, it will be removed. So for the chemical engineers here, or actually for the engineers here, you know, typically engineering talks about taking things at small scale and scaling up, right? That's what we do all our lives, right? We're taking small scale, scaling up, and trying to show it's the same performance. And in the biotech industry, this is particularly important. In the case of virus studies, you do the reverse. So here you have a manufacturing facility producing huge amounts of product. 
But now you, the, the FDA or someone comes and asks you, can you prove there are no viruses there? Okay. So firstly, it's rather impractical and not very uh, useful to go and contaminate this whole thing with virus and then show that you remove them. Right? That's, that's not going to work. It's, it just can't be done. It's not practical anyway. So what you've got to do is design a small scale experiment where you spike with virus, show clearance of that virus, but then guarantee that this small scale experiment is representative of the manufacturing facility. So it's really inverse to what we usually do as engineers. We are actually scaling down. Okay? So that's how virus works. There are, as I'll explain later, it actually is impossible to validate virus clearance in one step. There are many steps that are used, but virus filtration is one of them. And if you like, it's a rather loose ultrafiltration membrane where you want to reject virus particles but let your product of interest go through. Okay, so that's what virus, and that is somewhat unique to, to biotech applications. You don't have virus filtration membranes in water treatment, okay? In water treatment, you validate virus clearance by using ultrafiltration or reverse osmosis, but again, the regulations are far less strict. And the, the argument is that with drugs, you're actually putting them into the person, into their bloodstream or somewhere. With these other things, you're ingesting them so your own body's resources should be able to get rid of them, generally speaking. So, so the, the, the regulations are definitely less strict. Okay? Um, and then we have something on membrane biofilm. One of the faculty members here is going to talk about that. Uh, and then uh, there are a couple of other lectures, uh, membrane hemodialysis given by... Uh, uh, Professor Jacob, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about these emerging applications. So um, we'll see how the class goes, and depending on how far we get, I'd like to talk about some of the emerging membrane technologies. So there are variations in existing ultrafiltration, uh, microfiltration processes that people are working on that will make them more uh, efficient and uh, higher performing. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'm happy to talk about uh, viral vaccines and liposomes and exosomes, depending on how much time we have. Let me just add this. So everything I've mentioned so far focuses on producing proteins. This is really important to remember. So monoclonal antibodies are basically proteins, OK? So all of the biotech industry to date has worked on trying to produce, I mean, monoclonal antibodies are huge today, uh, on, on protein, remember the fusion proteins, other sorts of things, but they're basically proteins, OK? There is a great deal of interest in purifying virus particles. So here is the thing not to get confused about. I just told you that viruses are contaminants. We want to get rid of them. Yes, when you're making protein-based biopharmaceuticals, they are the contaminants. You want to get rid of them. But sometimes you actually want to grow virus particles. Why? Well, you might have heard of gene therapy, right? Gene therapy is something that we talked about for 20 years or more. But if you look at the products, there are very few of them. And they're sometimes a million dollars a dose. They're exceedingly expensive. So what does gene therapy do? Well, the idea is if you have a tumor, a cancer, you know, you can go and have chemotherapy and things like this. But that actually indiscriminately affects all the cell cells, right? But you just hope that you can kill more of the tumor cells, otherwise you'll kill the patient. In gene therapy, the idea is you want to take your, your drug and target it directly to the tumor, if it's a solid tumor. And you can do that using virus particles, because viruses, again, are designed to go and attack specific cells, very, very specific. So if you can do that, you can put your drug of interest inside the virus capsid, use the virus as a vector to go and selectively kill these cells. That's a very nice idea. But uh, development has been slow because, again, you have to produce the virus particles. How do you produce it? Using cells, typically mammalian cells. Now you've got to purify the virus, so you still have all the contaminants that you have when you produce proteins, host cell protein, host cell DNA, contaminating virus particles because you modified the cells. You've got to get rid of all that, and you're trying to actually purify a virus. And so these are particles, and so it's actually quite complex. And the, the methods that have been developed for protein purification don't often work very well because they weren't targeted for viruses. So I'll talk a little bit about that if I can. And then liposomes and exosomes are the other basically uh, uh, vectors that are being de designed to specifically attack cells. And then there's a electron blood oxygenators, which I'll talk about. Uh, these are used for open heart surgery. Um, this is an interesting, uh, from an engineering perspective, blood oxygenators are interesting because uh, this uh, technology has been around now since about the 80s, uh, late 80s, that uh, microporous membranes were used for blood oxygenation. So the idea is when you have open heart surgery, if you have to actually cut open the patient, you have to stop the heart from beating. So if you stop the heart from beating, 
you have to find a way to oxygenate the body, otherwise the person's going to die. And so you have a microporous membrane outside the body, and the blood flows through this, you oxygenate the blood, you put it back in. And, and this was a big thing in the 80s and 90s, but you can imagine that these sort of surgeries are actually, uh, you know, quite traumatic, right? You've got to open up the patient, typically give them blood transfusions. And so today we are working much more towards non-invasive techniques. So the number of blood oxygenation procedures is actually going down that requires, but there are still ones that require them. So I'll talk about that. And that's actually was one of the very big applications for, for membranes. And then depending on time, I'll talk a little bit about leukodepletion and plasmapheresis. And I think uh, uh, Professor Jacob was going to talk about some uh, other applications also of, of biomedical membranes. So that's basically the course, and that's the outline of how we'll, how we'll run this. Um, I, I put some of these, you see membrane-based bioseparations, I put all these together. Actually, though the lectures come in different orders, many of them are linked, and so I'll refer from one to the other, okay? So, uh, let me talk a little bit about membranes then, and I think this is actually a good segue into what you're going to talk about, about later. So, many of you work with membranes, so the first question is, what is a membrane? So, who can define a membrane? There are quite a few people here, right, working on membranes. Who wants to define a membrane? How would you define a membrane? It's a barrier. It's yellow sun so that you can pass through. Maybe based on size, Okay, okay, that's actually pretty good. So basically, you're looking at selective passage through some sort of medium, right? Now, when you said barrier, uh, we will see later there are many different types of membranes. So this barrier concept is, is vague, but basically, it is a, a third phase that is going to separate two phases and selectively allow something to go through, whether it's size exclusion or whether it's solubility or differential rates of transport. And then you also mentioned something else that's very important, which is a, some sort of driving force, right? A gradient of something. That's very important in these sorts of separations. So uh, why are membranes of commercial interest? Does anybody know why? why are, so what you said is, is correct. So then, uh, but I mean, we have many other processes, right, that can be used. So why are membranes interesting for separations? Anybody? I mean, why are membranes interesting for water treatment? Why not use dissolved air flotation or something else? Or sand filtration or, or some, why are membranes interesting? Cost Sorry? Cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness, uh, maybe, yes, yes. Uh, simplicity, yes, yes, that's a good one. Uh, sorry? I didn't, sorry? Yes, yes. So scale up is, is often uh, easier with membranes. Yes, yes. So that's good. These are some of the reasons why membranes would be of commercial value. Uh, what is meant by bioseparation? So bioseparations is when you're using membranes specifically for purifying biopharmaceutical products. Okay. So there's nothing very special about it. It's just a different application for membranes. Um, and uh, um, basically, as we've said here, here's a membrane, you have two different phases. So basically, if you like, a membrane separates uh, two phases, and you have selective transport through the membrane. So uh, characteristic industrially uh, uh, important membrane separations, basically, the most important thing is a separation's goal. And you will see as we work through these bioseparations examples, the separation's goal is important because that determines whether a membrane is actually useful or not. Okay. So one of the things that people have tried to do a lot in the past is use membranes because membranes actually can be used to, to uh, replace many separation processes, but many are not really commercially viable. Okay? So, you know, it has to be commercially viable. So that's important. Uh, it depends on the nature of the feed, nature of the membrane, and of course we talked about driving forces. Now there are different types of membranes, which maybe not everyone is aware of. So we have solid, liquid, and gas membranes. And, and let me explain that. So, so uh, we got a good definition. A membrane is used to separate uh, two bulk phases by a third phase, a membrane phase. That's probably the, the, the most general we could say. The membrane phase could be homogeneous. It could be homogeneous, so it's a solid membrane. It could be heterogeneous, or it could be a collection of, uh, of phases. And the membrane can be non-porous. So for gas separations, you are using non-porous membranes, right? Reverse osmosis is effectively non-porous. It can be microporous or a macroporous solid that's filled with a fluid, liquid or a gas. And I'll explain that in a minute. 
So the membrane controls the rate of mass transfer between the phases. So one phase is enriched while the other is depleted of a particular species. And as we mentioned already, the movement of a chemical species is governed by some sort of driving force, right? And this driving force could be a chemical potential difference, it could be electrical potential difference, it could be a pressure. Now, we talked about why membrane-based separations are interesting, and some of these came up, require less energy, so cheaper, uh, environmentally benign, easy to design, niche applications. It turns out in the biotech industry, actually, it's an interesting area. So the biotech industry is one of these areas that's a bit different. Cost is not always the greatest driver there, okay? So in water treatment, cost is critical, okay? If you can't do it cheaply, nobody's going to be interested. Uh, in the biotech industry, actually safety is the biggest thing. So, you know, you will never get a drug out if you can't validate all these, these uh, the, that it's totally safe to give the patient, which is why there are many drugs that never make it, because the cost is actually too high. That's why bioseparations, again, is very important. And so, ease of design becomes very important in the biotech industry. Because much more even in the chemical industry, if you imagine, say, running a chromatography column, where you have a certain elution peak, right? Many of you may be aware that if you scale up this column, getting the same sort of elution peak is quite difficult often, right? Because there are different mass transfer resistances. So how you scale up is very difficult. So in the biotech industry, this is a major problem because if you have a certain elution peak, you have to guarantee you will get the same elution peak if you scale up. Because if you don't, you can't guarantee the same purity. And that is critical in biotech applications, okay? So this is, this is difficult, it's complicated. Another problem with, with resin-based chromatography is that you have to pack the column. So now, you know, in the lab scale, it's easy, right, doing a small, but you imagine these huge columns, right? One meter in diameter. You have to pack it in a reproducible way. That is very, very complex. And if you don't pack it the same way, you might not get the same elution peak and you have problems, you see? So scale up is very important. So ease of design and scale up is critical. Membrane units are modular. They're actually quite easy to scale up. You have one module, a second, a third, a fourth. You just keep adding, you see. And so that is a very, very big advantage for membranes, which is why membrane-based separations are of great interest. And the other one is niche applications. And uh, this I'll give the membrane adsorbers, which we'll talk about, an example in the, in, the, in the biotech industry where there's a niche application for membranes, and we'll talk about that. But also in the biomedical area, actually all of them are niche applications. So blood oxygenation, before we had microporous membranes, was done using something called bubble oxygenators. But actually, today they, can't, they could never compete because there's far too much blood damage, okay? So membranes are unique in that they can do this without damaging the blood. Similarly with dialysis and other things, if you did other methods, it'd be very, very difficult and it just wouldn't work because uh, they, they, they wouldn't be as gentle on the, on the blood. So these niche applications are actually critical in the biomedical field, okay? So those are the two reasons, just to always think of this, these are the two reasons, ease of design and niche applications that make membranes of great value in these areas. Um, so definition of a membrane we talked about is a, is a is an interface between two adjacent phases acting as a selective barrier, thus uh, organizing a system into components and regulating the transport between two components. I put these two figures up because actually all the membranes I'm going to talk about here are synthetic membranes. In fact, it's even more restrictive. We're going to talk about polymeric membranes, okay? But I just want to make you aware that there are many other types of membranes. There are ceramic membranes, so inorganic membranes, of interest in water treatment, but also in, in other areas, in chemical separations, because they're just more sturdy, they are more robust, uh, you can use much harsher cleaning conditions. Downside is ceramic membranes are very brittle, so they are, they are more expensive to make and easily broken, okay? There are also metal membranes, palladium membranes and so forth that are used, rather expensive, but used for very specific catalytic uh, applications. But the other part is that all of our bodies have membranes, right? So there are biological membranes. And biological membranes are significantly more complex than the polymeric membranes we make, okay? They are very, very well designed to that specific thing. So you think of the skin, that's a membrane, right? And it uh, can change its properties. So if you're hot, you're starting to sweat, right? It lets water come out and so forth. So a lot of research these days is focused on trying to come up with tailored membranes that basically can respond to various stimuli. And that is also a potential interest in the biotech industry. So I just want to make you aware that uh, biological membranes are actually far more complex 
And you know, like the new generation reverse osmosis membranes is trying to look at specific channels for, for water transport and so forth. I would say that these sort of advances are going to occur in areas other than the biotech industry first. Again, because something else to bear in mind when we talk about bioseparations, if you come up with a new membrane, the first question that someone will ask you is, are the components that make this membrane FDA approved, okay, or any other regulatory authority approved? If they're not, you have a major problem because you're going to have to get this material itself approved and that is very expensive and takes a very long time. But if it's something like polysulfone, uh, PVDF, any of these things that are already approved, then you're kind of halfway there. So that's why I'm saying some of these new, uh, new designs and things probably will not be in the bioseparations area, okay? All right, so then uh, summarizing some of the things we said, a driving force comes from a great chemical or electrical potential. In the work we talk about here, a lot of it will be pressure-driven filtration processes, so there's a, there's a, a, a pressure uh, driving force, and some of it will be due to uh, concentration or, or chemical potential. Uh, we don't talk much about electrical potential in, in my part of the lecture. And then the driving force uh, is proportional to the flux. So does everyone know what flux means? So flux is uh, what you transport per unit area, right, per time. That's the definition of flux. So that's an important concept. So we have the flux is proportional to a driving force divided by the resistance. That's just a fundamental uh, way that we analyze these problems. And then the membrane it has different rates of transport due to different rates of membrane solvent solvent interactions or by partitioning a species at a membrane fluid interface. Okay, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the different types of membranes that exist because again, this is important to remember that there are many, many types. So we can talk about solid or dense membranes. So some of you mentioned gas separations, I think, when I was talking earlier. So these could consist of any combination of miscible or immiscible liquid and gas phase. So you can have a dense membrane. So it's basically a solid, non-porous, and on either side, you can have two gases, right? So you're trying to have gas permeation, selectively pass one gas from one side to the other side. You could have a gas and a liquid in a process called pervaporation, where you have components, but one component from the gas phase passes through the membrane and uh, basically vaporizes, right? So you have a liquid here, you have various things here, one vaporizes, and it uh, collects as a gas on the other side. And then you could have two liquids on, on, uh, on uh, either side, and uh, one example is reverse osmosis, which basically is a dense membrane. But you could also have something called postraction, which hasn't really taken off very much, where you have a liquid here, and one component from the liquid passes through. But in all of these, the transport is relatively slow because you have a dense membrane. So you have to pass through interstitial spaces in this polymer, okay? Now, all of these applications are really not used much in the biotech industry today. There is interest in pervaporation. Okay, but, but they're not really used from a practical perspective industrially at all. But they're used for gas separations and other things. Okay? Another sort of membrane, you can have a solid porous membrane where one bulk phase fills the pores and it could consist of any of the following. So imagine now a porous membrane like a microfiltration membrane. So I mentioned here, processes include dialysis, electrodialysis, nanofiltration, ultrafiltration, microfiltration, and nanofiltration. Those are the ones we'll talk about in this course a membrane extraction. So what basically we're talking about is a, a liquid phase on either side. So in reverse, in um, nanofiltration, you have liquid phase on both sides. You have rejection by size exclusion, right? So uh, in dialysis, you have liquid phase on both sides. The, the driving force is a, a chemical potential, a concentration difference. So actually, you have to have two-way transport, right? Because if one thing is going the other way, something else is going to move in the opposite direction to make sure the chemical potential is the same on both sides. Otherwise, you will have movement of solvent from one side to the other, which you don't really want in dialysis. Um, and so, so you can have that. And you can also have a gas on one side and a liquid on the other side. And that's an example of blood oxygenation, OK? In blood oxygenation, you have microporous membrane, liquid on one side, blood, gas on the other side. You have oxygen transfer to the blood, and you have uh, CO2 transfer the other way. You could all, somebody talked about controlled release, is that right? Did somebody mention controlled release when we were talking about what people are studying? Um, but uh, maybe I forgot. But uh, that is an example of a solid on one side, okay? And you have, say, a drug or something, and it's slowly released. Solid on both sides is not, is not practical. So you can't have solids on both sides in the membrane in the middle, okay? 
Uh, we also have things called liquid membranes and gas membranes. So in liquid membranes, you can consider supported liquid membrane where the pores are filled with a distinct liquid phase. So unlike uh, microfiltration, you have a different phase that fills the, the liquid in the membrane. So imagine a hydrophobic membrane that contains an organic phase stuck inside the membrane, two aqueous phases on either side. So the organic phase has to be immiscible in the aqueous phases, and that way it is kept inside the membrane pores. Okay? So you could do that, and if you did that, so now you have a membrane with an organic phase, if it's a hydrophobic membrane on e on inside the pores, you have gas on either side. So you can have selective transport of, of components from this gas from one side to the other. So gas on both sides, you can have a gas on one side and a liquid on the other side. It's called a supported liquid membrane. Or you could have liquid on both sides. These sort of separations exist. Some of them are of potential interest in biotech applications, uh, but none of them are commercialized. Okay? And then finally, we can have a thing called gas membranes. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is used actually, or there, there have been attempts to commercialize it as well, specifically for uh, treating various sort of... Uh, a gas stream. So you imagine that you basically uh, have um, uh, a gas that's, uh, that's, that's inside the membrane pores and you try to remove one component that can vaporize from a liquid. So ammonia, for example, that's in a wastewater stream. You vaporize it and pass it on to the other stream. So that's so-called gas membranes. So I just wanted to point out that when you talk about a membrane, they're actually quite complex. They could be a non-porous, they could be porous, they can contain a different phase to the two bulk phases. So the biotech applications, we are basically talking about porous membranes, okay, and aqueous phases. Okay, so I think I'm almost at the end of this introduction. Let me now move on to bioseparations a little bit. And I'm sorry that that didn't come out large as large as I would have liked. But uh, this is giving you some sort of idea of uh, the various uh, processing uh, s operations that occur in making a drug, okay, the schematic representation. So if you want to think about it, you start off with uh, some sort of inoculum. So, you know, if you're going to make a product, typically uh, the, the protein you're going to make, there's a cell line that makes it, okay? So there's been a lot of research and stuff done beforehand, and you've come up with a cell line that makes this product of interest. So that has to be done first, okay? And this actually, all this stuff takes years, okay? But anyway, it's done. So now you know that this cell line produces this product. So the first job is so-called upstream purification, upstream manufacturing, where you're basically trying to make enough cells to produce this product. So you start off with your, with your inoculum, and then you go through these various uh, different uh, bioreactors, getting to larger and larger, larger scale, okay? So you start off with a very small one, a slightly larger scale, and a slightly larger scale, and then you also have this media preparation. So all of this part is so-called upstream uh, operations. And that's not part of bioseparations. But it is important to understand that because if you are designing a purification train, it's very important to remember what's happening upstream because ultimately, that's what's going to determine what you have to purify, right? So it, it's critical. And when people don't design these in, in parallel, it turns out that you end up wasting a lot of time because you design something that doesn't work, okay? So now let's think of it. So we've got our cells, and we know the cell line we're going to use. We know it produces the product of interest. We start off with inoculum. We slowly expand this. So the first challenge there is to be expand these cells. Remember, the cells, I mean, they are, their goal in life is to reproduce themselves, okay? That's what they want to do. But your goal is not that. You want to have enough cells so that you end up with a large enough volume so at some point, you force it to produce your product of interest. So initially, it's expansion stages, right? So you're expanding the cells. And that also is, requires a lot of, you can have, uh, you can have uh, attached cells, and you can have uh, cells that are floating in the medium. There are various things you can do. And you have various growth medium you have to use. So this is where you can get potential virus contamination, right? From the growth medium and from the cells, because the cells are reproducing themselves. And as they do that, if they are reproducing virus particles, they're producing more and more and more of those. At some point, then, you get to your full-scale bioreactor. Now, one thing to remember in what I've talked about here, this is all a batch process, right? So for those of you that are chemical engineers, we like to work with continuous processes, right? We like to do continuous manufacturing. Why? Because it's potentially cheaper, right? Because you don't have to stop, you grow it, then you stop, you clean the whole thing, start again, that takes time. But there's another very important reason, and that is you can get better product quality. 
Otherwise, you can get batch-to-batch -batch variation, and that is actually a big deal in the biotech industry because you're working with natural, you're working with animal cells. So your product quality can vary. So if you could do this continuously, it'll actually be much, much better in terms of product quality. And I hope towards the end of, the end of this, we, we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the attempts people are making to move towards continuous biomanufacturing, okay? But continuous biomanufacturing is quite different to say continuous manufacturing in the chemical industry. The scales are very, very different, and the time scale is different. You know, if you go to a petrochemical plant, continuous manufacturing means you run your cat cracker for, what, 300 days or more, right? Then you stop, reload the catalyst, and you start again for another 300 days. In biotech, continuous manufacturing maybe one month, okay? If you can run for a month, you probably produce enough product for the next three or four years, and that's enough, stop, okay? But the batch process is quite different. So it makes a certain volume, you stop, you have to clean. So for the moment, most things are batch process. Then you get to this uh, harvesting stage, which is the first, of the, if you like, the start and look at purification. And that's often called midstream uh, purification. So we have upstream, we have downstream, and this is so-called midstream. Sometimes people call it, call it that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about harvesting. And uh, in this figure, they show basically uh, uh, a centrifuge here and a concentration step here, but um, uh, there are other processes as well. So we are going to talk a little bit about uh, about membrane applications here in this in this in this midstream area, okay? And then there's depth filtration. So all of this actually falls into this so-called midstream, and typically you need more than one step. But just remember in your mind. So we've grown these cells. The midstream operations, the harvesting operations, are purely focused on removing particulate matter. You don't want the cells anymore, okay? The cells were not your product. The cells were mini reactors to produce your product of interest. Something else that's unique to, to proteins today is that most proteins are made by, ex the, the cell excretes the protein into the growth medium. So that's very nice, because if it does that, you can then remove these cells. Now, something else to bear in mind here, I told you the cells are not the product, right? So you grow cells, you expand them, expand them, then you want to really switch this so the cells are producing the product of interest. But the cells are living organisms, so they die, right? At some point, they die. So we talk about something called cell viability. The viability in the bioreactor is how many live cells you have relative to dead cells. So dead cells are not something that you particularly like because when a cell dies, it typically breaks up, right? So when the cell lyses, it releases all of its components inside the cell into the growth medium, and there are enzymes and other things that start floating around, and they could potentially attack your product, right? They could denature your product. So that's one bad thing. From an engineering point of view, there's another very bad thing. These cell lysates, okay, are particularly difficult to remove, because if you've looked at it, I've talked here about centrifugation, depth filtration. The centrifugation is using what? Differences in density to separate the stuff. Depth filtration, membrane filtration using size. Unfortunately, when the cells lyse, your density differences are going, right? Rapidly, everything is coming to the same density. Size exclusion becomes difficult too. Now you've got lots of small particulate matter, and it also be, tends to be very aggregating. So you can lose a lot of product by adsorption on these bits of lyse cell. It's difficult to separate. So lyse cells are not a good thing, okay? So the good thing is that today, most of these products, the cells excrete the product of interest, and your job as a, a optimizing this process is to figure out at what point you want to start harvesting. There will be some drop in viability, okay? So you typically run at about 90% viability, and the optimum point to harvest then is going to be a trade-off between what's the highest protein concentration versus how many live cells and how much you do recover of this protein. And so the viability drops a little bit, okay? But, but the important point is that typically the, the challenge is trying to find the optimum point and the product of interest is excreted into the growth medium. That's the important point. The me reason I mention that is when you talk about virus particles and trying to purify virus particles, unfortunately, most virus particles remain inside the cell. They are not excreted by the cells, okay? So when you come to harvest these virus particles for, for gene therapy applications, you have a bigger problem because you actually have to lyse the cells to recover the virus. So that makes your purification more difficult. That's why I told you, recovering virus particles and some of these new therapeutics is quite complex because methods developed for proteins today are not ideal for this, okay? 
So once we get through this midstream preparation, we potentially have something now where we've got rid of the particulate matter, so we've got our product of interest floating around in a liquid, the growth medium, with lots of other junk that we don't want. It's got host cell proteins, host cell DNA, all sorts of stuff, okay? And so that's when we start on all these downstream purification processes. And you can see here we have buffers that we have to add, so we need sterile filtration. We do have a resin-based chromatography steps, typically for the so-called capture step, the first step, where you basically bind your product of interest, let everything else flow through, and then you elute your product of interest, okay? Typically that's the first step, and then you have polishing steps after that. And then this shows you a virus filtration, freeze thaw, fill and finish, and so forth. So this is the whole manufacturing process, okay? But in this class, what we are more focused in is just the downstream processing part, plus the harvesting part, which I talked to you about. So this figure then, which I think is actually a very good, uh, good figure, shows you what happens basically after harvesting. So you're starting off here with basically your liquid, your product in the growth medium. Now, one of the things that the biotech industry is very clean, keen on is something called platform technologies, okay? So, you know, for people in chemical engineering, and maybe some of the chemists also are aware of this, in the chemical industry, we like to have certain unit operations, and if you design an oil plant, an oil refinery in India or Singapore or anywhere else, it's using roughly the same unit operations, right? This is a platform. You have cat crackers, you have distillation, so forth. In the biotech industry, this has been very slow to come. People have been basically, if I'm designing something, I start from scratch, and I design something. And then you're designing something, you start from scratch, and you design, and she designs something, and so forth. But really, this is rather inefficient, right? And so the industry has moved towards trying to come up with platforms. This is an example of a platform, but the minute we talk about a platform, every process will have an exception to this, okay? But it gives you some idea. So the platform is basically this. We start off after our uh, uh, um, harvesting step, and the first one is so-called so capture step, and typically one use pro uses protein A affinity, okay? So protein A is basically a protein that is very effective at binding monoclonal antibodies. It's typically a resin-based column, okay? Is it okay? Okay, um, a resin-based column. Now, after the protein A, it's a, what they call bind and elute it. You bind your product of interest, you elute it, you recover this in the elution pool, as it's called. Okay. From there, you can see here, we have this pH adjustment step, and we have elute hold vessel. And you can see here a 0.22 micron filter. That's a sterile filtration. So, I talked about sterile filtration. Any buffer, anything that enters your process stream has to go through a sterile filter. Also, typically, you put these sterile filters between unit operations, as you can see here. They are all ways to just guarantee there are no microorganisms, okay? They're, they're, they're very important. The another important aspect of sterile filtration, it removes any aggregates. You know, these proteins are very, very uh, um, uh, easily, uh, their conformation is changed, they're very fragile. Any aggregates that occur are really a big problem. So the sterile filtration is good for this, but it's for removing uh, microorganisms, but also product aggregates, and we'll talk more about that as we continue. Now, this pH adjustment is very interesting. That is a virus clearance step. So it turns out that if you can adjust the pH, typically you lower it, you can actually inactivate retroviruses. These are the ones that were produced by the cells because you modified the cells using material. This is a particularly big problem because if you think of it, you have all these generations of cells, right, as you're scaling up your upstream processing. So you end up with like, mathematically, 10 to the 15 virus particles per ml. That's huge. You can't grow viruses to that tighter, so you can never validate clearance, because if you can't spike at that tighter, even in a small-scale experiment, how can you prove you remove them? So you have to have multiple unit operations. That is one of the challenges in bioseparations. The low pH hold will actually remove uh, about maybe 5 log. That's 10 to the 5 uh, of these retroviruses, something like that, okay? It is tricky because it depends upon your protein being stable at low pH. Low pH may be about pH 3, something like this, okay? But that is a virus uh, clearance step. Okay, after that, you have more guard columns. You have uh, 0.22 micron filters. And then you can see you have polishing chromatography 1, polishing chromatography 2. These polishing steps are to remove uh, contaminants. In the biotech industry, contaminants are host cell proteins. So proteins linked to the host cells, host cell DNA, and validating virus clear. So those are the three main contaminants. So these 
subsequent steps are basically for that. Now, a platform technology would like to use just two of these. Uh, there are people that have proposed platform technologies with just one, if you're lucky enough to do that. But if you're unlucky, you might have to use multiple of these, these polishing steps. But there are disadvantages of that. It's expensive, as you can imagine. Every step adds money. But in the biotech industry, it's a bigger problem. You know what that is? So the, the, it's a very high value added product. So as you're purifying this, each gram is worth millions of dollars. Every time you put a new unit operation, you will never get 100% recovery. You aim for more than 90%. That's quite indifferent to, say, water treatment oil industry. So then you're losing a lot of money just from the fact that you're losing product, you see. So you want to minimize your processing steps. So in these two steps, you often have a membrane process, a membrane adsorber step, okay? Uh, and then we get to this uh, virus filter. That's where we talk about virus filtration. It occurs towards the end of the purification stream, another membrane step. And then in between all this, we often have buffer exchange. So we have ultrafiltration. Also, every time you run one of these steps, you probably dilute your product. You have to concentrate again. So you use ultrafiltration. And then finally here, there's a final ultrafiltration, diafiltration step. Diafiltration is buffer exchange. That occurs towards the end of the processing scheme. So, uh, so this gives you a summary of the various uh, membrane applications and how they fit overall. I know that's quite a lot, so as we go through the class, I will keep referring to this diagram so that you have in your mind where these processes fit in, okay? And I wanted to stress again, so membranes are very appealing, they are very useful, and uh, people would like to use membranes because of ease of scale up, but it, it, it doesn't mean that we're ever going to end up with a totally membrane process for puring, purifying a, a, a biopharmaceutical. There is, in fact, a paper somebody once wrote on trying to uh, develop a whole process using membranes, but the reality is that that's probably not commercially viable. Okay, before I finish, I just want to say a couple of other things. The first recombinant protein, actually, was insulin, and it was, it was in 1982. So that gives you an idea of the age of the biotech industry, okay, from the early 80s, basically. In 2018, eight of the, uh, eight of the top 10 best-selling drugs for biologics, biopharmaceuticals, made by recombinant DNA technology, with worldwide sales over $6.7 billion per year. And this particular monoclonal made by Humira is actually, uh, it's made by this company, Abvi, and it generates at it 20 billion in annual revenues by itself. So it just gives you an idea of, the, of the, the value of these products, right? So that's something that's important when you think of the biotechnology industry. The structure, the way the industry runs is very different, say, the chemical industry, okay? I also then wanted to just tell you here, when we talk about purifying virus particles, we would also like to develop a platform technology. But unfortunately, the platform doesn't really exist today because people are still doing what they did with proteins maybe 20 years ago. <clears throat> but, an, an, but an idea or a, a way towards this would be as follows. We start off with uh, maybe a, a microfiltration step, and then there's virus filtration, ultrafiltration, and so forth. So these are some of the stages that could be used. Okay. Um, a couple of other things to remember. Um, in the biotechnology industry, there's a great deal of interest in using what they call single-use uh, uh, devices. So you use them once and you throw them away. Actually, this is quite interesting because in the U.S. it is rather expensive if you're trying to reuse a, a membrane to be able to clean it, if you like, validate that it is clean, and then reuse it. That costs a lot of money, it's a lot of time, a lot of uh, buffers and things are used. So this single-use actually is, is quite interesting in so-called ready-to-use format. It's pre-sterilized. It eliminates the need for steam sterilization and cleaning, reduces energy costs, water uses, disposal of environment-challenging chemicals. Capital costs are significantly lower because otherwise you're using these stainless steel vessels. That also makes it much cheaper. They can be brought online very quickly because you just plug and, and, and run, okay? So it's very easy. Um, and it therefore can be uh, help reduce manufacturing timelines and it facilitates changeover in multi-product facilities. So, you know, one of the things also that happens is, if you think of it, you have a facility with your various unit operations to make a drug. Maybe in a month or two, you can make enough drugs for the next two or three years. So then what do you do with this facility? Just let it stand there, so that's very bad, right? So you'd like to be able to switch, especially the large biotech companies, to making a different drug. So if you want to do that, that's very complicated because you've got to guarantee it's totally, you've removed any trace of the previous one. And so again, if you're using uh, one-time-use disposable systems, very easy. You just throw it all away, put up your new uh, filters and everything, and run again. So it does facilitate that, which, which reduces cost 
and reduce the risk of cost contamination, enhances manufacturing flexibility, and better respond to product fluctuations. That's important in something, say, like developing vaccines, like influenza vaccine and so forth. You might have a spike, but you need to produce some quickly, so you can quickly change over. Okay? So that's, that's an important uh, reason for this. Emerging therapeutics, so I've talked about this a little bit, nanoparticle-based delivery systems enable targeted delivery of a therapeutic to a specific site. Particle-based delivery systems are particularly important for development of viral vaccines and gene therapy applications. Virus particle-based delivery systems such as, and there are many of them by the way, so you may or may be familiar, attenuated, recombinant, infectious, inactivated virus particles, as well as something called virus-like particles, subunits of virus particles, they're all highly effective. So these are all delivery vectors. The one that I think is of particular interest is so-called virus-like particles. So people are developing technologies where, you know, we talked about growing the virus, right? So that's fine, you grow it, and then you have to kind of purify it. But another way to do it is to get the cell to just make the virus capsid and nothing else, okay? And often you can get the capsid to form because th it's thermodynamically stable. So if you can actually drive it, you have these capsid proteins that would come together and form the capsid. These are so-called virus-like particles. The reason they are nice is that the particles themselves are totally non-infective. Because remember, in all of this, if you are working with viruses, you have various biological safety levels you have to worry about. But if you're making uh, totally non-infective particles, virus-like particles, that's actually very appealing. So that's actually a new area of, uh, of development, and there are many, many uh, potential vaccines that could come out of these. One major reason for slow commercialization of virus particle-based technologies is inefficient purification operations. Another challenge in purifying virus particles is that it doesn't exist with proteins. You know, cells produce viruses, but they're not all complete particles. Sometimes a very large number of them are actually defective particles. Those are useless because you can never use them. And as I say here, the ratio can be sometimes 10 to 1 defective particles to, to, to actual particles you want. These defective particles, you know, for a natural virus, that's fine. So they won't infect you, so it's fine. That's why you don't always get infected when you're next to someone who is infected. However, uh, when you're developing uh, drugs, the defective particles can also go and bind to cell receptors, but they have no therapeutic effect. So you lose efficacy of your drug. Removing these is very complicated, and that's actually a major challenge today, and is why some of these gene therapy applications are rather expensive. And then there are also, in most cases, uh, self-assembled vesicles can encapsulate aqueous solutions of hydrophobic compounds, and also exosomes are extracellular, uh, extracellular vesicles that carry various biomedical cargoes, such as mRNA and DNA and so on. These are also developing uh, methods for, for these sort of clearances. Uh, I think I have two slides left. So this is an idea of a, of a platform for, for purifying uh, virus particles. So the clarification step is a little more complicated, as I mentioned earlier, because you have to lyse cells at some point, okay? So, so that's uh, one of the, the complications here. You have to have isolation, you have nuclease treatment because you want to get rid of all the host cell DNA. Uh, purification and polishing, you have the same contaminants as in uh, protein purification, but virus particles are much more fragile, actually because if you damage the surface properties, they won't actually be able to target cells anymore. So the surface, so that makes uh, binding elute chromatography, or you bind an elute rather tricky, because when you bind an elute, you might actually damage some of the surface markers, or they might change a little bit, and then they won't be as effective at targeting cells. So purifying virus particles turns out to be much, much more complex. Uh, finally, we're going to talk about uh, blood oxygenators. These are microfiltration membranes. I'll talk a little bit about uh, cell washing and plasmapheresis. And there's dialysis, ultrafiltration, and hemofiltration. Uh, and this, this is some, some, some diagrams of uh, basically what the idea is with uh, these processes. So blood oxygenation, I explained already. We're trying to oxygenate the blood outside the body. Uh, plasmapheresis, there are two types of plasmapheresis. There is uh, basically donor plasmapheresis, and there's therapeutic plasmapheresis, OK? So donor is when you go and donate your plasma. So you can donate your plasma, and then you're, you're, you're basically doing that for like a blood transfusion. But there can also be plasma phoresis for therapeutic uh, reasons. And then there's dialysis, and then this is a, a cell washer. So we'll try and talk about some of these biomedical applications also. So with that, that was all I had for the introduction. I think we're actually at 1 o'clock, right? So I think uh, uh, we take a pause there, is it?
Any questions on the introduction? Any questions on the course, on how it's going to run? Anything you'd like to cover instead or add to this, just let me know. And we can certainly talk about that in more detail. Okay, thank you.